Hello and welcome to August 2023's virtual opening. My name is Emma Wilson and we're delighted that you could join us. This month's feature artists are Dale Roberts, Carlos Gamas de Francisco, Dietlin Vanderskaff, and Christopher O'Connor. We'll hear more from them in a few moments. Thank you, first a few thank yous. Thank you to our artists who continue to inspire and engage with us every day with the new works that they're creating. And thank you to our clients for continuing to support the arts and having it be a part of your life. So let's meet this month's feature artists. First, I'd like to introduce artist Dale Roberts. Translating the visual experience of life into the language of paint, Dale is not content to paint things the same way over and over again. He is always searching for a surprising way to handle the paint and to solve a visual challenge. Dale's primary medium is encaustic and other ancient media. His interest in ancient media began when he studied egg tempera at art school and has continued as he's learned metal point drawing. Dale leads workshops all over the country and in Canada. He has taught at the Encaustic Center, the Encaustic Conference, RNF Paints, and the Canadian Federation of Artists. His teaching concentrates on distilling the common confusion and hesitancy around encaustic and other ancient media. Dale earned his BFA from the Tyler School of Art. He lives in Norristown, Pennsylvania with his family, where he gathers inspiration from his backyard garden to nearby cityscapes. Please welcome artist Dale Roberts. Uh, uh, thank you for that introduction, Emma. It's great to be here and it's great to be part of this gallery. Uh, my name is Dale Roberts and uh, my background, I'm from upstate New York and I grew up in a farming community and uh, really had no idea that one could make a living as an artist. Uh, although I knew that I loved to draw and paint from the time I was a kid. So uh, along the way, I uh, managed through a series of <laughs> unusual events to find myself at RIT. Um, as I said, I came from upstate New York and uh, financially the, the means weren't there to really do that, but uh, other things were in play and I ended up there. And so uh, that very first year, I was told that I needed to go somewhere else uh, based on what they saw and what I was interested in pursuing. So I did stay around one more year and they put me in their graduate painting program, which was a nice gift for sure. Um, and then I ended up at Tyler School of Art down here in Philadelphia. So at Tyler, I was uh, continued to be acquainted with a lot of ancient mediums. Uh, when I was at that graduate class at RIT, I decided to explore egg tempera. And so I was buying pigments and figuring out how to use those mediums and essentially being self-taught. Uh, when I came to Tyler, uh, those things could be explained more fully. And I found that to be a big part of the reason uh, that I was there. I'm so glad for it. So at, um, at Tyler, I was um, uh, trained in the rigorous um, uh, fundamentals and everything really from abstraction to realism. And um, uh, when I graduated, I thought, well, I sort of need to distinguish myself. So I thought I'd start working in encaustic. And so um, I just gathered up the tools and um, resources from a book called The um, Methods and Materials of Artists, and I just began painting. Uh, and that's kind of the way I, I teach encaustic when I teach it. It's certainly the way I approach it in my painting. I would say that I'm a perceptual painter because the visible is so deeply interesting to me, and uh, I am compelled to paint from life and to paint from life in an interesting and unusual ways. And encaustic just makes that happen almost naturally. I find that my work is a metaphor uh, for what I'm looking at. And I hope that metaphor is inviting to you. Uh, each painting has a story, uh, even the still lifes. And um, I was once told that if you do paintings that are interesting to make, there's a pretty good chance they'll be interesting to look at. And so uh, I would say that sums up in a nutshell my work and my views on painting. Uh, I'm an editor. Um, I paint what's already out there, and uh, I certainly enjoy doing it. And so I've enjoyed this conversation, and thank you so much uh, for your invitation. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks. And now I'd like to introduce artist Carlos Gamas de Francisco. Carlos was born in post-revolutionary Cuba in 1987 to a Cuban-Spanish mother and a Cuban-American father. 
He grew up in Cuba and was educated in an academic style heavily influenced by the Russian Academy. At the age of five, he determined with absolute certainty that he would be an artist. And by age 15, Carlos was diligently painting eight hours a day. Today, he often spends up to 15 hours a day painting, and more recently, with his newly born baby Carlos to keep him company in the studio, is passing the time away. At the time of this recording, Carlos is painting a 14-foot commission mural at the Clefstone Inn, right up here in Bar Harbor, Maine. He is an artist whose range of work includes watercolor, photography, and acrylic. Please welcome artist, artist Carlos Gomez de Francisco. My name is Carlos Gomez de Francisco. I'm currently exhibiting at Portland Art Gallery in Portland, Maine. Um, in this work that I'm showing at the gallery, um, I am talking about many things that I have um, um, shown in my work for several years. Uh, for example, I have been obsessed with art history. I remember the first time I went to a museum, uh, many of the paintings from the past centuries were portraits. So when I was 15, I started making copies of these paintings and that helped me to understand how to capture the essence of the human figure. Uh, paintings, uh, portraits from the past, they remind me uh, of Instagram posts today because uh, when everybody's showing off their perfect life, the life that they don't have. And in the past, they were showing off their jewelry, jewelry, dresses, and the best room in their palaces. And everybody was depicting having the perfect life. And in, in the past, only the royalty and the powerful people were able to afford to, uh, to commission a portrait. And my goal is to depict everybody, that everybody have the right to be uh, in the portrait. So when I discovered my art style, I took reference from different periods uh, such as Renaissance, and I added uh, some contemporary things. And I think that is uh, the essence of my work, uh, how to uh, understand the past in order to build the future. And recently, uh, some of my figures have some distortion because the way of how we distort reality and we all have uh, some uh, many different point of views, even when we talk about the same facts. Uh, my goal is to um, represent everybody with power and confidence. And that's the way that we all should feel because we are all the same. Uh, also, I added um, in some of my pieces, for example, I had symbols uh, such as um, uh, pieces of furniture because of uh, a childhood story. When I was 15 years old, uh, my mother, she wanted to buy the couch, but she wasn't able to afford. Uh, being in Cuba, is um, people don't make enough money because it's a communist country. So my mom has to save money for two years in order to save for a couch. And after two years, when she bought it, she never allowed me to sit on the couch. She always said uh, it was only for decoration. So I saw the couch as a museum piece and only um, was for exhibition. And every time I went to a museum, it reminds me of the couch that I had at home, that I have to keep a distance from the pieces on the paintings that I love. Um, there are all other symbols in my uh, paintings. Uh, for example, I add insects uh, such as butterflies or beetles. And to me, uh, when they're flying, it means freedom. When they're falling, it means chaos. And when they are uh, lying down, I mean uh, balance. And this came because uh, when my grandfather, he was alive, he told me that uh, he was from Spain and he met Salvador Dali. And Salvador Dali, he used symbols uh, um, like ants and in his paintings. And to him, they have other meanings like uh, sexuality and fertility. So I said, well, if he, um, if he was so creative and he was able to use symbolism in his paintings, uh, I would like to do the same. And then that's how uh, all these ideas came to my mind. Uh, also, I um, in the last three years, I started covering the faces on, in, of the main figures in my pieces because I like uh, to add some mystery in the figures and also because of privacy. Uh, I always thought that depicting the feelings uh, and depicting some emotions in my painting was the most difficult part. And then I said, well, how can I do it uh, without showing the eyes? I think that will be um, even more difficult. So in most of my pieces, uh, you will notice that there are things that are 
covering the part of the face. Um, I I will I will love to see you at the opening at Portland Art Gallery. Uh, I will be there during the opening on August the third. And thank you so much. And now I'd like to introduce artist Dietlin Vanderskaff. Standing at a typical gallery view, viewing distance from one of Dietlin's paintings, the viewer notices shapes, marks, patterns, color, sometimes a pop of gold. Up close, however, the textural complexity of her work is fully revealed. Dietlin is an encaustic painter, using brushes and a blowtorch to layer her canvases with paint, beeswax, and resin. A finished piece can have 50, 60, or more layers. The layering technique has evolved to become key to her process the rhythmic application of materials and fusing them together, a kind of ritual that centers her and reflects her longtime study of yoga and meditation. Dietlin holds an MFA from the University of San Francisco and an MA from the University of Southern Maine. She is a core instructor for RNF Handmade Paints and the former president of New England Wax. Please welcome artist Dietlin Vanderskaff. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction, Emma. I appreciate those kind words. Uh, my name is Dietlin Vanderskap, and I'm with you today in my studio in Westbrook, Maine. I'm very fortunate to have this beautiful uh, space that overlooks the Presumpscot River, uh, which I can see out of my windows and is definitely an influence on my work. So I'll tell you just a little bit about what I do, um, because I think that's kind of important to understand when you look at the work. I work with something called encaustic. This is a beeswax-based paint, and it's applied in layers, and then you have to fuse each of the layers with a heat gun or a torch. Um, I also use oil paint on the surface. So I use something called a pigment stick, which has a little bit of wax in it. And then I also use 23 karat gold leaf. The process of working with encaustic is something that I find uh, very um, meditative, and it's a process that I really enjoy, although it's very slow, and um, I often think that uh, there are probably other ways that I could produce paintings more quickly, but this meditative process of building layers and then bonding them together, which can take hours, is what I find draws me closer and closer to discovering what my work is about. So I don't start off with a specific idea um, when I'm painting. I'm more interested in just observing the marks and lines as they appear and then responding to them. So I really think of painting as a meditative practice. Um, there's, it's, a, it's almost like you get into a flow state as you're continuing to work. On, on a piece and then watching and carefully absorbing what's there and then responding to it with more lines and colors and marks. Um, I use a lot of poetry as an inspiration for my work and also words from other languages. So there's a word chicken, which is a Japanese word that refers to the silence between thoughts. And this is um, something that I think kind of describes all of my work. I'm really interested in the poetics of the moment and finding that balance between stillness and movement that's um, both present within us and in the world. My paintings aren't specifically about anything. They're not intended to be representations of specific things. They really are more intended to convey a felt sense of an experience. And I want them to invoke that in the viewer, ideally. Um, so the influences for my work uh, range from Zen Buddhism to Christian mysticism, the poetic traditions, um, and also yoga and meditation, which are really important practices for me. Part of my work this month, the work that's on view, um, involves five paintings that have sort of a small cup-like form or bowl-like shape in them. And um, these works were all um, made inspired by a poem by Rumi, and it's called The Bowl. Um, many, many years ago, a dear friend of mine gave me this handmade mug, um, and then inside of it, she had typed these words from this Rumi poem, and it says, um, he gave to me a bowl, and I saw the soul has this shape. That, that line, that poem really transformed this simple gift of this small handmade bowl or coffee mug into something uh, metaphorical and symbol symbolic that was so much deeply more meaningful. 
And that also is something that I've pondered over the years, like, what is the soul? What is the shape of the soul? What does it look like? So in these works, I'm sort of playing with um, that form and you'll see it in clusters. Uh, you'll see it sort of hovering in the frame of the piece. Um, they can also take on other meanings in some of my work. That sort of shape is also a nod to my Dutch ancestry. I think of it as like a tulip, sort of the symbol of a tulip. So it, ha it has a lot of different meanings for me, but that's that's one of them. And so when you look and you see those five paintings, you can understand a little bit about what those pieces are. You'll also see in those works, well, in all of my work, that I'm using uh, 23 karat gold leaf. And that is, um, the reason it's in my work is that I see it as a symbol of the divine spark or inner light inside of all of us. And there's a Sanskrit or a Hindi word, yoti. And this um, word means divine spark. And so when I started bringing the 23 karat gold leaf into my work, that's really what I was thinking of. It also, in some of my water-based series, um, it serves as to reflect light. So it makes the piece a little bit more dynamic. Um, another whole bunch of pieces that are in this show represent my interest in water. And so they are symbolic of lakes and rivers um, that I've explored, but they're really not any specific place. I'm really much more interested in water as both physical presence, something that's reflecting light and pattern um, that you can look down into and see what's underneath, but also thinking of it as a metaphor for ourselves, specifically for our minds, which I think of a lot as being very similar to water in the sense that our true nature, the true nature of the mind is this inner stillness and calmness, but we can disturb it so easily um, by chasing after ideas that we have or um, latching onto stories that we create. So in my, in my experience as um, a practitioner of meditation, I think a lot about water as a metaphor for that. So those are really the, the two main pieces, bodies of work that you'll see in this show. Um, you'll see a few other pieces that I think of as abstracted cityscapes. So they're much more about the movement and the changing of light from morning through the afternoon and into the evening. Um, and you'll see some carved elements in there that might symbolize birds, repeated hatch marks that might look like or suggest windows in a building. But again, they're really not supposed specifically trying to look like anything. It's really much more about that felt sense that you have when you experience the paintings. Thank you for taking the time to come and check out the show in person or watch the um, virtual opening. And um, I look forward to connecting with many of you. All right. And now I'd like to introduce artist Christopher O'Connor. Christopher finds deep inspiration in the natural world with a focus on capturing the beauty and wonder of nature in all its forms and to share that experience with others through his art. Christopher says, above all, my mission is to create art that not only captures the beauty of nature, but that encourages others to see it in new and meaningful ways. Whether through exhibiting my work, collaborating with other artists, or in my own daily practice of creating, I am dedicated to using my art as a tool for positive change in the world. Originally from a small fishing town in the southwest of Ireland, Christopher arrived in Maine 11 years ago. Fortunately, it hasn't been much of an adjustment to make when landing in Portland. The salty air, the screeching seagulls overhead, the timeless bellow of a distant foghorn are just a few of the distinctive qualities that play out in both places. Maine has become his home away from home, and we are so glad it has. Please welcome artist Christopher O'Connor. Thank you, Emma, for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, yes, I'm Christopher O'Connor. Um, I am new to Portland Art Gallery, and I am very excited to be showing at the, the gallery next week um, with Dietland and Dale and Carlos, other artists. I, I know Dietland for, for many years, but I, I haven't met Carlos or, or Dale yet. But uh, I'm excited to be there. This is the first time I will be showing at uh, a show in Portland Art Gallery. And the work I have for the show, examples are in the background. It, it's a varied show for me, which is really exciting because I have been working, I, all throughout my life, I worked on many different subjects and, and many different um, angles of subjects, but I have never allowed myself to stay with a series and, and kind of 
tunnel into it, so to speak. Um, but with these with these three pieces in the background, they are all examples of series that I've been working on over the last number of years. Um, there's a river reflection series, there's a coastal water series, and there's a what I call a blossom series. Uh, it's turning into almost a magnolia series. Um, but what I love about these pieces, and especially when you work on a series for a while, is initially the limitations or what can seem like limitations of um, subject matter the more you work with it the more it starts to open out into other possibilities and of course as artists that's what we're always we're always mining and digging and trying to find gems in the earth um but with these series and especially working on something over years you you start to discover lovely aspects of things uh, and then with different series the, those aspects seem to come together and and what i've noticed for myself with these pieces all, all these three different series when seen in conjunction with each other is that they have this they have these perspectives that are very specific to each one for example the 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 river reflection you're looking into and with the blossom pieces you're looking up and with the coastal waters you are mostly looking down and what's interesting about these is it's always you're looking out at and it, it all of a sudden made me aware of you know our limitations in our physical body whereas with these paintings and with art in general you you get to be outside of your body and then allowing your imagination to soar into wherever it chooses to go uh, these paintings have a lot of even though they're they're quite tight in places there's a lot of looseness. The, clo the image from a certain distance, you recognize it as a tree reflected in water or, or coastal waters or waters, rocks. Um, but when you go up close to it, you'll start to notice that it's just made up of all these little abstract shapes. And in fact, sometimes the image kind of collapses and falls apart. And before you know it, you are in a place with your imagination that the painting is alive for you and and that's really what i'm after is to to get the viewer into the work and that's probably where the subject matter it allows the viewer in it's not purely abstract but within once you're in or once you're drawn in the abstraction opens up and then i think anyone can soar in that area because it's pure imagination it, it is not for just certain kinds of people or imaginations or ways of thinking. Um, and at least for me, that is how I experience these paintings. Um, when I paint them, I spend a lot of time in the drawing out phase, which is both lovely and excruciating. And those are not days you might want to talk to me very much. But, <laughs> but once I start painting, um, it, it's really quite lovely and and things start to open up and the painting constantly is changing and and i feel like that as a viewer that's the experience i want the viewer to have is is where they're seeing this thing unfold and and waver back and forth and sometimes they forget maybe hopefully what they're looking at um and so that's that's what i'm excited about with the show coming up next week at Portland Art Gallery is to be able to show these pieces to people for the very first time um, and get their responses. I think it's gonna be a riveting show. I can't wait to show there. And I um, very much look forward to you all coming to the opening next Thursday on the 3rd. Um, hope to see you there and always call into Portland Art Gallery. There's always something in there you will find interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in to our August virtual opening and to Dale, Carlos, Dietlin, and Christopher for your remarks. If in Portland, please stop in to see us seven days a week, uh, here 10 to 5.30 here at 154 Middle Street in the heart of the Old Port. Subscribe to our newsletter at portlandartgallery.com. Follow us on Instagram at Portland Art Gallery. And I invite you to subscribe to our podcast, Radio Maine with Dr. Lisa Belaya where Lisa engages in interesting conversations with artists, creatives, and members of our community. Until next time, be well, stay curious, and keep in touch. Thank you.